Thank you, Lisa, for that introduction, and hello, everyone. What you are going to see this evening is a reading of a play. And when a play is read, you, the audience, have to bring a great deal of your own imaginations to the proceedings because, as you can see, we don't have a set or costumes or anything like that. So for that reason, some of the stage directions will also be read to give you an idea of what you will be seeing in the future of this piece as we continue to develop it. We've been working on this piece for a long time and we also have a longer version of this play. It's about double in length with more music and more scenes between John and Mildred. And we are also hoping to be able to make a film, uh, Jesse Lipscomb, who is playing the part of John Ware, is uh, a partner in a film company called Mosaic. And we're very interested in seeing this come to the screens uh, across Canada, North America, and the world, going into production in 2014, and hopefully out there for you to see in 2015. And this will be a collaboration between me and Mosaic, and our, our country and our government, but also between people like you who have a soft spot in your hearts for John Ware. So thank you. My name is Cheryl Fogo, and I am the writer of this piece, and I would also like to introduce the cast to you. Earlier today when we did this piece, I forgot to say that the first person to come out, Miranda Martini, who is the musical director and composer of some of the original music for the piece is also my daughter. And I'll ask them to come out now. And followed by Janelle Cooper, who's playing the part of Mildred Ware. And Jesse Lipscomb, who's playing the part of John Ware. You will also notice that we have a cameraman on stage with us, Matt Palmer, who is helping us out by shooting some video footage for the little promo uh, video we would like to make for the future life of the play and the film. And Matt has instructed me to ask you to just ignore him. There are so many people I would like to thank today, and I wish I had a list of all the names of the people that I've met just today from this community who have been so wonderful to us, who have given us food and taken us around to places in the area where we could shoot some amazing video. I just want all of you to know, all of those who I met today, that I thank you from the bottom of my heart, and we all do. But I would especially like to mention Louise Schmidt for having invited us to participate in your celebrations, and Vicki Hutton for being our very able contact person and host for the day. Christian, who is on the technical end of things, has been amazing. I would like to say a thank you to Dawn and Mary Mallory, people who are members of your community, for their careful stewardship of the Ware family legacy and their generosity and support of my research. I appreciate it very much. I would like to thank John and Betty Polson and Kate Miller and Clem Martini. And I would like to say a special thank you to a man by the name of Doug Grant. I don't know if he's out there, but he loaned us this cooking pot to have on stage with us today. And it's a very inspirational piece because it just so happened to belong to John Ware. So thank you for this. And finally, just before we begin, we would like you to know how very special it is for us to be able to bring John Ware Reimagined to Vulcan, the community, community that was home to Nettie and Mildred Ware and brought so much happiness to their lives. We know that many of you knew Nettie and Mildred and we are deeply honored to have been invited to the Vulcan 100 celebrations. When I was a child, there were stampede rituals. Make sure string on cowboy hat is not too loose or too tight. 
anticipate visit from Winnipeg cousins, take bus to stampede with cousins and siblings, eat a burger, a hot dog, a hot dog on a stick, candy floss, and a candy apple, go on 50 rides, feel sick, get tongue stuck on popsicle, on popsicle and nursing a sore tongue and sore tummy, drop by the agricultural displays to visit paint and buttermilk. Play the midway games until many stuffed toys and a random household item have been won. Present random household item to mother upon triumphant return home. Over 55 years, the rituals have evolved. Now I compile a list of all stampede breakfasts and barbecues, smile smugly to myself knowing how small my grocery bill will be for stampede week. I think about cowboy, buying cowboy boots, but I always change my mind because they're too expensive. I laugh at my husband, Clem, when he dons the white straw cowboy hat while making pancakes on Stampede Sunday morning because it's too small and it sits on top of his head like a bald eagle on a lamppost. I call everyone in the house to come out on the deck around 11 every night to watch the fireworks and I go to the stampede. I visit the super dogs and the agricultural displays, especially the horses. And I think of paint and buttermilk fondly. I eat one hot dog on a stick and the little donuts. I go on three rides before eating those things. I play the birthday game until I win a prize. Then I wonder, what am I gonna do with it? And I go home feeling that between the stampede breakfasts and the stampede visit itself, I've heard Cadillac Ranch enough times to last me for quite a while. Now on the stampede grounds, there is a building that was erected shortly after I was born, named for the four wealthy movers and shakers who branded my city. This year, I began a new ritual go down to the grounds, stand in front of that building, and imagine that it says, the Big Five. It's possible that I've read every document with John Ware's name on it. I've searched dozens of dusty old books, made note of every mention of him, no matter how small. I've read letters written to and from his daughter. I want to be the one to find that buried fact, that key that tells me everything, the difference between myth and truth. Could he lift an 18-month-old steer over his head? Did he discover oil in Alberta? Did a wild horse he was riding buck itself off a cliff into the river below? And did he rise up out of the river, still in the saddle? Well, maybe one day I'll find that key. For today, there are three things I want you to know about him. He was smart. He was funny. He hated fences. Give me land, lots of land under starry skies above. Don't fence me in. Let me ride through the wide open country that I love. Don't fence me in. Let me be by myself in the evening breeze. Listen to the murmur of the cottonwood trees. Send me off forever, but I'm asking, please, don't fence me in. Mildred Ware stands, wearing an overcoat on top of a nightdress and giant rain boots. The wind whips her hair about. She shields her eyes, scanning anxiously. The sound of footsteps, footsteps sloshing through water, then a look of relief as she spots someone coming. 
John Ware appears, long john underwear visible beneath the Prince Albert coat. He is carrying a large, wet, half-drowned boarhound. Is he dead? Almost. What about the horses? Two gone. They swept away with the stable before I could cut them loose. I drove the others up the hill. They'll be all right. Are the children all right? Nettie's frightened. Robert. Yes. They're all frightened. Except for Billy, he never woke up. Are you all right? Where are they? Up at Beresford's. Flo says we can spend the night there. That might be best for tonight anyway, then we can go to mother and father. Are you all right? You know what I'm going to say. A flood could have happened anywhere, Millie. This could have happened in Millerville. You'd better get him up to Beresford's place. Yeah, I should. A good rub down with a blanket and he'll be his old self, won't you, boy? Poor old Bismarck. You want to know where I found him? On a log. Just hanging on a log, just his head peeking up like a beaver. It snagged on some rocks, otherwise he'd be halfway up to Medicine Hat by now. You said we wouldn't stay if I didn't like it. You saying you don't like it? My house just floated away. But other than that... <laughs> Calves are dying. When I was six years old, I had two identities. The one identity required no embellishment. I was born with my special hair and skin. The other identity, the one I had chosen, required a uniform which my mother bought for me at Woolworths. It consisted of a black skirt with a red fringe, a matching vest, a checkered shirt with mother of pearl snap buttons, and a yellow cowboy hat with a whistle on a string at the neck. On days when the weather was bad and we couldn't go outside, my brother Richard and I hitched our two horses, paint and buttermilk, to our wagon and rode across the prairie. Now, it was not a fancy wagon. It had no cover and the weathered old boards and rusty nails that held it together were pretty rough, but it suited. It held our cook pots, blanket rolls, and Richard's six-shooters, with enough room left over for us to stretch out under the stars at the end of a long, dusty day, meandering across the open range. We went easy on paint and buttermilk, setting a lazy pace whenever we could. But there were bandits and thieves and cattle wrestlers in those days. When they got on our trail, we'd have to ride hard. Yeah, yeah, Richard would cry, standing in the wagon, trying to hold his balance as the wheels bumped wildly over ruts and roots, 
urging our horses forward with cracks of the reins, while I flung my body across the wagon, doing my best to prevent our meager belongings from bouncing out and rolling away with the tumbleweeds. Hours later, when our mother would come in and tell us to untie our scarves from the kitchen chairs and get down off that table because it was time for supper, I would be disoriented. It was hard to come back from the crackling fire under starry western skies where we had just been cooking our sausages in 1889 to the 1962 cracked linoleum of our small house. In grade two, at the height of my cowgirl phase, Chubby Checker became the first person with the hair and skin belonging to my other identity to achieve sufficient fame to attract the notice of the children in my Boness school. Even my teacher, Mrs. MacArthur, went crazy for the twist. As the end of June approached and Stampede loomed, she announced a twist contest with a prize for our end of year party. She said we could wear costumes and I turned up, of course, in full cowgirl regalia. It was the only time I recall a meshing of my two identities and I held nothing back, twisting in my cowboy boots all the way to the floor and up again, the little whistle on the end of my cowboy hat string shaking and rattling in time in perfect rhythm with we'll go twistin', twistin', twistin' till we tear the house down. I was the greatest twisting cowgirl in all the land and cherished my prize, a box of Cracker Jacks, long after the peanuts and popcorn had gone stale. But it wasn't long after that when I became persuaded that my two identities could not, in fact, coexist. There were no black cowboys on the Saturday morning movies. Dale Evans and her friends counted no sisters among their numbers in the cowgirl adventure books I'd been devouring. People with my special hair and skin did not exist in that world. I outgrew my little skirt and vest and checkered shirt, and my mom put them away. Richard took the money he'd been saving to buy a pony and bought a bicycle. We moved on. Mildred Ware is standing at the window, looking out at the corral. <gasps> look at her! Now, I'll a man left with your corn. Oh, Lord! Don't sit down on your own. Then we'll all promenade with that sweet corner maid singing, oh, Johnny, oh, Johnny, oh. Nettie, get down! We done got the cattle in. Now, bow to your partner and take a full speed. John, do you see what she's doing? What's she doing? She's standing on the back of her horse. Partners to your places, like horses to their traces. Well, she'll be all right. Just tell her to get down. I did tell her. She won't listen. Now, you think I should do the dose of dose or the Georgia rang tang? Once and a half and you let her go, you can't get to heaven while you carry on so. But it's starting to snow, too. If she doesn't fall off that horse and break her neck, she'll catch pneumonia. It's your fault, you know. Mm -hmm. She spends the whole day running around after you fooling with bridles and bits. The child can't bake a cake to save her life, but she'll stand on the... Nettie, get down off that horse right now, I swear. I will come well, out there. Well, she's a sweet country gal, and she knows how to ride. Like souls like a man, she fills her daddy with pride. She can bake a cake. No, she can't. Well, she don't need to bake no cakes. Your cakes are the best for a hundred miles. <laughs> Two hundred miles. I'll go get her. I, just let me finish making myself look presentable. And you better get ready, too. It's almost time to go. Dose of dose or the Georgia Rang Tang? Both. Who's going to be there? <laughs> 
Oh, everybody. Uh, I see. <laughs> oh, the Wylands, the Odds, Jack Cummins, Pat Burns, Dan McNeil, Watson, Bliss, George Lane, Pete Smith, Bucksmith, Wolfhead, George Left Hand, the Cameron, the Shots, Hudson's right. Owens, Billy Sharpless, Cummins, right. Braden's, Joe Chase, right. Tom Lynch, Jack Ellis. All right. Everybody's going to be there. You better start getting ready, Millie. You know, I think I'm going to stay home this time. Why? Do said do all up and down. You're the prettiest brown girl in this here town. Come on, you bought that new dress special for this party. I haven't been feeling good. Nettie, get down off there and come on inside now. My cousin is still beautiful at 60. Not just she looks good for her age beautiful, but truly head-turningly beautiful. And I remember the day it happened. One Sunday night, she was playing in gawky, and the next Sunday morning, she outshone the stars. For a while, she remained our own private beauty. Every day, she put on full makeup and teased her hair into Diana Ross 1965 glamour. And then she sat herself down on her parents' couch, or maybe my parents' couch, or our other auntie and uncle's couch. She just sat there, and we tiptoed around in awe, stepping gently so the aura cost, cast by her beauty would not break. My newly transformed radiant cousin was revealed to the rest of the world at the Calgary Stampede Parade on the Brotherhood Float. Back then, that's what it was called, the belief that people should get along, that everyone should find safety and nurture in the world. We got up early, as was necessary when you were going to the parade, packed a lunch and the home movie camera, and I don't know if we took the number one bus or rode downtown in the blue and white Pontiac or if by then we had the Ford with the silver fins. I don't remember how we got there. I only remember feeling like I would combust from the excitement, the miraculous prestige of having a cousin in the stampede. The stampede was the greatest outdoor show on earth. If you had a cousin in the parade, you were valid, very valid. It was a long wait, there were other things to see, but I was impatient, you just wait. You just wait until you see her, I thought, as I looked around at the other parade watchers. And finally, she was there, and then she was gone. In an extended blink, the Brotherhood float sailed past, my cousin waving regally, her red-nailed hand sheathed in a long white glove. Well, I carried that glow of inclusion, of validation with me when we went down to the stampede grounds later that day, where I was confused by the Indian village. On the one hand, knowing how uncomfortable I was being singled out, stared at, I didn't relish being the one doing the staring. On the other hand, Richard and I had often envisioned just such a place in our Saturday afternoon games, and here was our chance to pick up tips to enhance the accuracy of our vision. Somehow we had escaped the Hollywood brain snare. We were not cowboys fighting Indians. We were two freelance buckaroos, wandering the range, pulling up a spare hide in a teepee, and falling asleep by the wink of the embers. But the village in my head lived in another time. It was the past. There were no cities, only outposts. This village was here and now and next to the Ferris wheel on the stampede grounds. So I was confused. I didn't know if it was real. I didn't know if I should like it. Then, the summer between grades five and six, I went to Brotherhood Camp. The Canadian Council of Christians and Jews sponsored children from diverse backgrounds to spend a week at Silver Creek Ranch in Water Valley, where they instructed us to ride horses and sing songs around the bonfire and become friends and engage in Brotherhood. Well, on the first day, it didn't seem to be working. We stuck to our own groups, mainly consisting of black kids, white kids, and kids from the Blood Reserve near Cardston. 
On the second day, a game was organized. I don't recall the details, but it involved a lot of running and there was a bridge we had to cross. Well, two girls from the reserve stood apart, not running, not crossing the bridge, just standing there with expressions that said they wished they could be anywhere else in the world but there. My brother Richard ran past them and pushed them in the creek. They screamed and climbed out and chased after him in their sopping runners, laughing and shrieking something like, we'll get you! And every child at Brotherhood Camp spent the rest of the week riding horses and having food fights and making door plaques out of wood chips and drinking hot chocolate and singing about Stewball the racehorse around the campfire. And when I left Silver Creek Ranch, I cried so hard, I thought I would never be able to stop. Stewball was a racehorse And I wish he were mine He never drank water only drank wine I stayed in touch with my friends from the reserve and sometime later we made plans to meet at the stampede we went on rides and ate junk and sat on the grass in front of the stage and listened to music and we went to the Indian village when I rode the bus home that night knowing they would sleep in their teepees with their families and whisper and giggle under the stars and wake to a morning where the stampede grounds were quiet and it was just them, I thought they must be about the luckiest people in the universe. I, I liked brotherhood. I didn't know it was a non-inclusive word or that putting six women with varying degrees of skin pigmentation on a float wasn't an actual dialogue or that sending a bunch of kids to camp and telling them the purpose of their being there was to not call each other names or throw rocks was a little risky. I didn't know any of that. I just liked brotherhood. There's an old saying, some are born great, some achieve greatness, some have greatness thrust upon them. John Ware's achievement, his greatness, was to pull people in and knit them together. He gave gifts that way. His gifts keep rolling through my life. His hand reaches back, plucking floating broken threads from here and there and here and tying them back together. Like the thread from the old Irish tune about an underdog racehorse, our campfire song that John Ware's story taught me had been adopted and sung by our common ancestors, enslaved Africans who understood what it was like to have to bet on yourself, even when no one else believes you can win. His bridle was silver, his mane it was gold. I'm 
a poor boy in trouble I'm a long way from home On a September day in 1905, six months after Mildred died of typhoid and pneumonia, John Ware's favorite horse stepped in a badger hole and rolled over on top of him, breaking his neck. The church was full for his service. People whose lives he had knit together came from hundreds of miles around, the high and the low, the small and the great. Two future Stampede founders helped carry him to his grave in Union Cemetery. I choose to believe it's true what some people had said. If John Ware had survived, there could have been another face on the poster. The big four might have been the big five. in charge while Papa's gone, you understand, baby girl? You get Bob to help you with the twins and Arthur and keep the baby with you even if he cries for Mama. Give him his medicine if I'm not back in six hours. You heat up that soup if y'all get hungry. He heads for the door, then remembers one more thing. And I don't want you running out to the barn to check on your calf. Pull your lip in, child, I'm not playing. You gotta listen today. I know it's cold out there and you're worried about him, but you gotta stay in here the whole time I'm gone. The whole time, you understand? That's my girl. That's Papa's girl. The door slams. <gasps> you think I'm dying? Elijah Rock, shout, shout. Elijah Rock, coming of the Lord. Neighbors are still talking about the slide. Can't believe it's happened. A whole town gone. A baby's sick. The storm hits and all the calves that are born later freezing. Now I'm sick too. You set out for Calgary for my medicine in the storm. When I had my strength, I put my foot down. You are not going out anywhere. Maybe that's why my strength has left me. All that work trying to put my foot down hard enough to keep you from going 98 miles on a fool's mission in a blizzard. But you are hard-headed. You think I'm dying. Satan is a liar and a conjurer too. You don't mind how he'll conjure you. If I could, I surely would Stand on the rock where Moses stood My life was divided into four Four times And each time better than the previous When I was a boy Until I was a young man Somebody owned me Somebody said he owned me The less said about time one, the better Ezekiel said he saw him with the mill wheel. John talked about him in the book of the seven seals. Time two was after emancipation. I was better off than some. I could ride and rope. There was no shortage of that kind of work, the work that got me out of the South. Of course, I always took a lot of ribbon whenever I hired on with a new outfit. Even after I come up here, I always thought I was hard of hearing too and couldn't hear him whisper. 
Look at this big old boy. Greenhorn, oh look at here now, the boss giving him Satan to ride. I hope he doesn't break his neck. See, they'd figured on teaching my uppity self a lesson for asking to join the crew by giving me the meanest horse in the corral. Now, I always went along playing dumb. Uh-huh. Well, what are these things here? Stirrups, you call them. Well, what are they for? Every cowboy on the drive be gathered round by the time I finished my song and dance. They couldn't wait to see how quick I was in to get my tail bounced off a bronc that not one of them been able to stick. But up on a horse, the wilder the better. That was my glory. When I set my foot in that stirrup and swung myself up in the saddle, that was my glory. By the time I got through riding that bunkin' machine to a standstill, the grins was wiped off their faces. Of course, I'd climb down and laugh it off, shaking hands all around. Oh, dang, I knew you fellas was just funny. But later on, when it was time to go to sleep and no one was looking, it was my turn to grin. Elijah. Time three it was like when Ophelia is just born and she's lying down there in the straw and in the mud and she thinks that's all there is. But then an hour later, she's running and kicking like she's never gonna stand still again. It was like everything I had done before was just pretend living. Up here there's so much space and, and the big old sky and folks didn't bother me, they let me be. I made some good friends. I worked till I had enough to buy my own place get my own hurt. I couldn't believe my luck the day I settled it up at the register. My own brand. Me. <laughs> Some folks say I never would have dreamed this. I never would have dreamed that. Not me. I did dream it. Every day when I was breaking my back, chopping indigo back in time one, I dreamed it. And there it was. Give me land, lots of land under starry skies above. Don't fence me in Let me ride through the wide open country that I love Don't fence me in Let me be by myself in the evening breeze Listen to the murmur of the cottonwood trees Send me off forever but I'm asking please Don't fence me in First time I saw her up in Baker's store, folks was falling all over themselves to introduce us. But I couldn't speak. My tongue had turned to cotton. I couldn't do a thing except nod my head up and down, up and down, up and down until my neck got sore. And then she spoke to me. But my ears had set to ring and so I was scared to answer for fear she'd said, oh, nice weather will happen. And I'd come back with a, I like pickles kicked myself all the way home where she thinks you're the dumbest fool she's ever laid eyes on. I promised myself if I ever saw her again, she was going to know different. Well, next time I saw her, I did a little better. I think I managed three whole words. I don't know why she didn't jackrabbit away, but she didn't. She stayed, and when I asked her, she said she'd have me. That was the beginning of time four. Just turn me loose, let me straddle my old saddle underneath the western skies. On oh my cries, let me wander over yonder till I see the mountains rise. I want to ride to the ridge where the west commences. Gaze at the moon till I lose my senses. Can't look at hovels and I can't stand fences. Don't fence me in. It's Daniel's crying that breaks through my fever. He's had such a weak, pitiful cry right from the day he was born. And it has a way of going right through your soul, his cry. My children are hungry. The fire's gone out and I feel like my bones are made of jelly. 
when I ask, where's your papa? And they tell me he's gone to Calgary to fetch my medicine, my belly turns over. What if I never see him again? What if he dies in the storm and I never see him again? What if the last thing he remembers is me fussing about Nettie not knowing how to bake a cake? Give him to me. Now take your brothers and sister to the bedroom and read to them from the storybook. I'm gonna fix us something to eat and I'll call you when it's ready. No, child, you can't go ahead and check on your calf right now. Do like Mama asks, go on. from the ranch to Flagstaff 723. Buster can do that in an hour if I push him. Five minutes to settle Buster at the livery stable, 100 miles on the train from Flagstaff to Calgary. That's two hours. Two blocks from the station to McLean's drugstore, three minutes. Half an hour from McLean to mix the medicine. Three minutes back to the station, two hours back on the train. Five minutes to pick up Buster at the stable and an hour's hard ride back. Go to sleep, my little lamb, my little bird. Five hours and 46 minutes till I can be back with Mildred's medicine. No, no, you're not thinking straight. Look at this mess. What is this? Sleep? Rain? You'll break Buster's legs if you ride hard on this. Extra time for flag stopping back. Add an extra hour. Six hours and 46 minutes. I told Daddy six hours. An extra 46 minutes ain't too bad. Seven hours. Let her live seven hours till I get back with that medicine. Just give me seven hours. And then what happened? The slick mud, and there's sleep that turns to rain, and then back to sleep. And Buster trots a step or two, but he can't go any faster than he's going. Crooker doesn't think anybody's going to be out in this weather, so he's locked up the stable for the day, and it takes ten minutes there. John's starting to worry he hasn't asked for enough time. He catches the train all right, though, and it runs pretty true, so he makes up some time. He's soaked right through and bone cold. But he stays next to the fire in the coal car and dries out some. Don't you know it's time for bed? Another day is through, so go to sleep, my little buckaroo. McLean! McLean! Open the store! Please open the store! You gotta be in there! Go around back and up the stairs. If he's closed down early, he'll be in the apartment. Why is this town always wasting my time? Yes, the same medicine, yes, bless you, brother. Ten minutes saved, wish there were more men like him. He don't waste your time. You say Mildred's sick, he gets the business. Ten minutes made up, okay, could be worth. You'll get the last train, could be worse. Close your tired little eyes, my little buckaroo. Soon you're gonna ride the range like grown up. Don't you know that once your dad was just a kid like you? So go to sleep, my little buckaroo. The wind has picked up and the rain and sleep has turned into knives that stab his eyes. And the temperature's dropped so low he's shaking all over. And he's still shaking when the train comes through. The train man comes through and tells everybody the train's going no further than Flagstaff. And everybody's got to find lodging there for the night. That's all right. This was far as you were going by train anyway. The worst is over. You got the medicine in your pocket. You caught the train. There's nothing between you and Mildred now but the prairie. 20 seconds, maybe 30 to get off this train. Five minutes to pick Buster up at the stable. A hard ride back. Two hours, maybe more. And that's the best you're going to be able to do. I need more time, Lord. Crooker doesn't want to give him Buster. John should spend the night there with the rest of the passengers. He says he can't believe John's planning to go on. I told you I'd be back for my horse. Crooker says you can't do it, John. This is a killer storm. Bed down here for the night and hope for a break in the weather in the morning. Can't do that. Just get my horse. They'll find your body and what good will you be to Mildred then? Get my horse. You won't listen. Oh, Lord, why won't you listen? Crooker gets Buster, but he's shaking his head, and the last thing he says is, you'll be back, John Ware. 
And it turns out he's right. Because for the first time, John, you can't get a horse to do what you want it to do. He coaxes and prods and kicks his flank. He flicks his behind with the reins and Buster trots a step or two, but he turns back again and again. He won't go. The storm is blinding him. The wind sounds like the devil. His ears are laid back and his eyes are rolling. Okay. Okay, boy. All right, I'll be back for you another day. Three minutes time wasted with Crook. Twenty minutes time with Buster. Just wasted time. Wasted time. Just wasted time. He pulls his pant legs out and tucks them over his boots and ties them tight with binder twine. I'm late. Oh, John. Stumbling through snow, collar pushed high, hat put low, your eyes froze shut. Fourteen miles. That's all there is between me and Mildred now. Just give me fourteen miles. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secure. lights a lamp and holds it up. Every part of John is covered in snow. His beard is iced. His gloves have been torn by barbed wire. Blood is frozen on one of his hands. Eighteen hours. There you are. There was a story about a cowboy named John Ware. He was out on the range blowing off steam with a bunch of his friends like they always did at the end of the roundup, playing cards, trading yarns, wrestling, boasting, carrying on. One of John Ware's friends had a hot rivalry with another cowboy, a big mouth. This friend of John's had made a bet that he had a horse that could beat big mouths. But when John's friend saw the other horse run, he knew he was kissing his money goodbye. But then, somebody whispered he'd heard about a fast horse that was running wild a few miles off. John's friend asked him to slip away in secret and investigate. When John found him, the horse's owner said he'd be happy to let John borrow the horse for the races. Only problem was, nobody could ride him. Well, the fellow barely had the words out of his mouth before John was on the horse's back, waving goodbye as they bucked off together into the distance. He's fast all right, John told his friend when he got back. But before you can get him to run in a straight line, you'll have to let him get that bucking out of his system. Make it a good long race and he's got a chance. Well, John was too big to ride. Everybody knows a horse needs a lightweight rider to run his fastest. But the two best riders available didn't last five seconds on this horse. They hobbled off, rubbing their backsides with a no thanks, not today. Well, there was no other option. If there was going to be a race, John Ware would have to be the rider. By race time, everybody heard about the contest and they lined up pushing and jostling for the best position to see. And John's horse put on a show. He'd had a good long rest and was up to the challenge of dealing with this nuisance that wanted to ride him. While John's horse sidewinded, rearing and snorting and biting, the other rider shot off straight 
and true and was so far gone by the time John even managed to get his horse moving in the direction of the finish line that some of the spectators had already walked away. But John kept going, whooping and hollering and holding fast. His opponent was confident and curious enough to slow down to a trot, turn his mount around and see what John Ware was up to on this demon steed. How was this man staying on that brute's back? Look at him! Look at him! Wait a minute. Look at him. He's coming. He's got that horse running. Oh, oh, I'd better go. The rival turned his horse's head and they were off again. Lucky he'd come to his senses in time. Still well in the lead, pounding, pounding, hooves flying. But was he in time? Oh no, oh no. Come on, boy. Yeah, yeah. There was that story. Well, some years after we'd packed up our own spurs, my brother Richard went to the Glenbow Museum for the first time on a class trip. I was in my room organizing my LPs in alphabetical order when he came home and he burst in with enough force to send the doorknob banging into the wall. Guess what, he said. But before I could guess what, he said, John, where was black? I stared at him blankly. John Ware, John Ware, you remember the cowboy, John Ware, the one who won that race that time. I, I did remember the name John Ware, but I couldn't take in what he was saying. What? He was black. Are you kidding me? You were there. I was there. And I wasn't the only one. Green Walters, Felix Luttrell, Pete Smith, Billy Welch, Tom Robertson, Jim Whitford, Tom Ringald, James Marshall, Leisha Bell, Harrison, and our little daughter. She was a cowgirl through and through. Well, it would have been nice to know if Richard and I had just ridden a little further, we might have stumbled across your camp in the moonlight. Maybe shared a cup of tea out of our battered old tin mugs. Did you know our children? A little. Your daughter, Nettie, became famous too. Traveled all over the world, but she rode a camel once. Where did she learn to ride a camel? From you. gotten within two feet of a horse. I don't like them. Fine. I hate horses. Mm -hmm. The mares, the nags, the studs, I hate them all. The only thing worse than the horses are the cows with their great big heads and the way they look at you while they chew their food. What are they looking at anyway? never get tired of looking at you on a horse. You look like a god. Don't blaspheme, darling. Well, you do. No wonder we have all these children. Those days when I have a pie in the stove and I come out to the porch looking for you because you say you go to the cellar and get me some potatoes so I can start supper. And there you are in the paddock. You forgot about the potatoes. Riding one of those big old broncs. And you know I'm mad, and I get my hands on my hips ready to holler, but before I can get to hollering, I find myself just watching you ride. And before I know it, I'm saying to myself, ain't that the prettiest man I ever did see? Do you notice?
Thank you. 